thatgreatbusinessshow.com is brought to you by de facto shaving oil the best anyone can get made in Ireland sold worldwide Welcome to episode 75 of That Great Business Show, posting on the 18th of February, 2022. I'm Conal O'Moran, and I'm joined today by One One, also known as Supreme Business Leader Susan Spence, who was interview one on episode one of this podcast way back when. That's why, Susan, we call you One One. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Conal. I do remember that first episode when you asked me a question that I couldn't answer. So there you go. You one want. for me as well. Well, what you're going to do today, because of what the lineup is, you're going to do all of the rest. I'm just going to pop out and I'll see you in about an hour. Is that okay? Great. That's how long it takes you to have a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Susan is here, as I say, to co-present with me today. But when she's not in studio, she also happens to run one of Ireland's largest woman-led international software businesses, Softco. Softco is sponsor of the Ireland women's and men's hockey teams as well as other bits and bobs that we'll get into later on. What we'll be talking about today is, does sponsorship work? Does sponsorship pay? How do you choose your sponsorship? How do you get a sponsor? What do those being sponsored think about all of this stuff as well, about being sponsored? We'll be joined shortly by two international hockey players from Team Ireland. And later, we have one of the country's fastest growing national hunt horse trainers and a most entertaining storyteller he is too. He'd explain how to take on the big players in the horse industry and, of course, how to make money out of the GGs, sponsorship included. All of the great business insights on this podcast are brought to you thanks to our own sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil. Man or woman, it's the best anyone can get. Buy it right now on DeFactoShave.com. And I'd better give a big shout out to Nick Mulcahy, editor of Business Plus magazine, easily Ireland's best business magazine, now that they've asked me to write a column for them about insights gleaned from that great business show. Business Plus is available from all the best magazine sellers, as they say. Now, famously, a brand that had sponsored footballer Roy Keane lost a lot of money and possibly a lot of brand value when he literally walked off the pitch of the World Cup, the now infamous Saipan incident. Sponsorships can be like that. You can get unlucky or like Softco, you can also get lucky. They sponsored the then unfancied Ireland's women's hockey team who defied the odds and went on to great success, winning a World Cup silver medal. Great news for Ireland, for Irish hockey and for Softco. But was that pure luck? How do you choose the right sponsorship? How do you make sponsorship work for you? What's a good sponsorship? Well, who better to answer those questions than Softco boss Susan Spence, who made that call on Ireland's hockey team, and I'll talk to her in a second about that, because we're also joined in studio by Katie Mullen and Hannah McLaughlin, both of the Ireland women's hockey team, to give their perspectives on the value of sponsorship, as well as shedding a little light on their twilight world of almost professional, but not quite, they still have to earn a living. Katie Mullen, Master of Engineering, works as a medical visualization engineer, I've no idea what that is, with Axel 3D, and they are medical 3D printing experts, while Hannah McLaughlin has served some time in Davy Stockbrokers as an intern, but she's now again in her final year doing economics and finance at University College Dublin. Welcome, Susan, Hannah, Katie, to that great business show. Susan, let's start with you. The I truth. The I want truth. the truth and nothing but the truth. <laughs> Did you just get lucky with your hockey sponsorship? Well, I think when you do things for the right reason, you do get lucky. So this was that easy. That kind of sounds religious to me. It doesn't it? I know, yeah. <laughs> no, look, this was kind of simple. This was uh, Joan Morgan, who I played hockey with back in the 1920s, I'd nearly say, uh, phoning me up and saying, we've no sponsor, we need help, will you sponsor us? And that was only a few months before you were actually getting on the plane to play in the World Cup. Uh, they would have been the only team that had no sponsor. So, of course, I said yes. Well, you said, of course, but, you know, your heart knows you've got a great business. How many people do you employ? Uh, about 150. Uh, worldwide? Yes. Um, so Finland, you, Ireland, UK, US. Your job, which you've done very, very successfully, is to make money yes. out of your business. So when you look at a sponsorship, 
it's all very nice to say, oh, listen, she's a pal. I played hockey with her. We'll give her a few quid. But it's... Well, not- actually, you're right, because this made sense as well. I mean, the, the, the tournament was being in London. Uh, we were playing against England. We are also playing against America, two of our biggest markets. So, look, if you look at it from a commercial perspective, it made absolute sense. Now, what none of us expected, except the hockey team, and Katie here did expect, they did so well. And the other thing about sponsorship is, it's easy just to give money to a sponsor. It's actually far more be- far better if you then activate that sponsorship. And that means really participate, become more of a partner rather than just somebody handing money over. And we've seen the value of that over the past number of years through different sponsorships that we've done. Katie Mullen, do you find it an absolute pain in the face when the sponsor says they want you to hang out a window holding a soft coat uh, branded uh, material or something like that? Absolutely not. Ah, um, she, she set you <laughs> up to say that. I'm being polite No. Um for sure, the biggest thing for us when uh, Softco came on board was the transition to looking um, and acting that bit more professional. Um, we trained very, very hard in a very strict environment, but it was very much just us on our own. We didn't necessarily have much of a backing or um, much professionalism in terms of something as simple as our gear. Um, so to take us to a World Cup with our first, you know, sponsored name on the front of the jersey, it just gave us that extra lift in terms of our belief as a team. Did you sit around in your dressing room or wherever and did somebody say, do you know what, we've got a sponsor? And if so, was there a woohoo? Well, yeah, pretty much for about a year in the build-up to the World Cup, we were trying to source a sponsor and there was a lot of back and forth and a lot of rumblings and at points we got our hopes up and then they came back down quite quickly. So... When Softco came on board, there was a huge lift for the team. And as I say, it wasn't just a, you know, here's a financial backing. There was also support brought in by Softco just through their expertise and in terms of helping us get that professionalism in terms of how we looked, but also little things that we were maybe a bit green to going to our first major tournament that they were able to sort of assist with. So something as such as, what are you thinking of, yeah? So something as simple as um, just prior to going to the World Cup, we had a jersey presentation day where the entire squad got presented with their World Cup jersey. And it was a, it was in uh, Dunleary Hotel and we, you know, the media were there. We got professional photographs done. Our parents were there and something like that we'd never experienced as an international team before to have that kind of presentation was really special. And that was, for me, the first moment where we all acknowledged that we were going to the World Cup. So something small like that, that Softco kind of really helped drive and and come up with that idea was very special to us as players because sometimes it's the stuff off the pitch that, that goes a long way. And one of the joys was when you came home. What was that like? Remind us, those who don't remember, of the bus ride home. Oh, it was incredible. So we got the chartered plane home, which none of us had ever imagined or envisaged that we would ever do in our did lifetime. She, did she pay? <laughs> don't answer, don't answer that. And uh, we came off, we landed in Dublin Airport. There was four fire engines on the runway, took us straight through. I don't even think we stepped foot in the airport. <laughs> um, there was no passport check anyway. <laughs> um, and then onto buses and straight into Dame Street. And I remember we were in, we were in the, um, city hall and, uh, we were looking out at the big stage on Dame Street. And I remember looking and there wasn't really that many people. And we kind of thought maybe this wasn't as big a deal as, we'd first anticipated um but it turns out i was looking at the back of the stage where there was maybe five or six people <laughs> hanging out and the girls told me to look beyond and there was eight thousand people there wow. and i think the crazy thing was the number of people that would have never been exposed to the sport of hockey before and they were there with their with their flags and just there to celebrate us and meet us and that was for us to get that reach in ireland for a sport that that is quite small was just incredible and Hannah, you're a newbie, if I can say so. You can. And you are on the coattails of this. What is it like for you? I should also mention that 
having worked as an intern in Davy, that you are a Davy ambassador, which is another layer of sponsorship, I presume. Yes, correct. Um, I suppose following on from, from Katie's point, I sat in Dublin with, with friends and family watching them over at the World Cup and similarly stood in, in town watching this stage be put up and some of my friends, people that I, that I played club hockey with coming out and not, not putting it bluntly, but just being absolute heroines for young girls standing around me, myself included. And I think. Did you uh, shed a tear? Uh, I don't know if I shed a tear, but I was definitely, definitely screaming, um, an awful lot. Um, and I think although I wasn't included in the squad, I, I felt it was a turning point for, for female hockey and for female sport in Ireland, something like that I had never even heard of. And when I think back to probably going to my first senior international match to watch, I was in school and it's, it's still a running joke that I actually asked after a few of the games to get photos with uh, Shirley McKay, Hannah Matthews and Anna Flanagan. And that photo keeps coming back up of me in school and going and seeing these players that one day I'd aspired to be in their shoes. And I find it still a very special moment to look back to watch them in the World Cup to be, I suppose, in the crowd to now being part of that team. Now, isn't that visualisation? Isn't that in business? Because we are, we are a business show, remember? And we have to get back to business. Well, isn't this things... the whole thing? You know what I often say about Johnny Sexton, when he's going to kick a ball, he sees it going over. When Leona Maguire hits her ball, she sees it going into the hole. Well, one of the things that we uh, we saw from the team, like it's, it's not one-way traffic. We got so much from the sponsorship. We watched this group of people with incredible belief uh, elevate hockey in Ireland as well and give great, I mean, they're fantastic role models to all females throughout the country. And like during the pandemic, I know you did, Hannah, certainly Katie and Aisha, who's the goalkeeper, um, they're brand ambassadors for us. Uh, they actually did Q&As with kids and teachers contacted us afterwards and said, look, you really, you know, helped kids when they were going through a tough time. But equally, um, I had Katie speak in front of, I think you were in front of 200 business women and they were just bowled over by her fantastic leadership. You know, the simple things that we can all apply to business that make us competitive and motivate teams and help us win. And lots of those experiences transform or translate directly into what we do in business. Well, that's a good maybe segue because is that strictly true? Like it is said that, you know, top sports people are, are hugely motivated and I'm sure both of you are, but does it actually translate into business? For example, in your business, you're an engineer. Where does your uh, practice on the pitch show in the engineering field? I think there's an awful lot of moments that translate across directly. I think for starters, the company I work for as a startup was a startup business um, five years ago and we are growing and striving. And I think that idea of having big, hairy, audacious goals, which you have in the sporting world in a company like the one I work for is massive. And um, I think as well, you know, Little things like working in a team, the communication, the coping under pressure is is huge. And and do you share that with them? I mean, you you are obviously, as again I say, you're trained, you're part of a team, world class team, and all. Do you ever sit around with a cup of coffee with your colleagues and say, "This is how we do it," or "This is how you get a goal," or "This is how you you visualize a goal," or whatever? Do you do you physically talk to them about it? Yeah, definitely. And it's a fantastic way to get your point across in the workplace, I find. You know, for example, you're trying to have constructive conversations in the workplace and take on constructive criticism, give feedback, receive feedback and giving examples that happen over and over again in high performance environment. It kind of opens people's eyes up to the way it should be in order to get success. And um, as as we experienced as a team a number of years ago, those tough conversations can be very uncomfortable at the start, but once you become accustomed to them, you just see the progress and the, you know, the success that comes out of them. And then all of a sudden, the more cutthroat that they become, the, you know, the better in terms of being successful and moving on and moving on quickly. And for me, the biggest thing, probably one of the biggest things I learned in sport, which coach told me at a very young age was, you can make mistake after mistake, Katie. I don't mind. It doesn't matter. 
just try not to make the same one twice. And I think that's massively the same in the workplace. People are going to make mistakes. They're not going to get things right over and over again. But you address the mistakes, you, you know, come up with a solution and you try your damnedest not to make the same one again. You are the Ireland captain. Do you have, do you want to be the boss of the business? I'm going to put it nicely. (laughs) Or maybe of a business. I think the challenges um, that come with high performance sport make you constantly hungry to be successful and hungry to strive for more. And I think I'm constantly looking for that in my workplace, which hopefully is a good thing in my job. Susan, I think we'll put that down as a yes. (laughs) Definitely yes. And, And Katie's right. All of us who've played sport We are obsessively competitive and we have to win. And I think that's what sport gives you. Let me me stop you there, Susan. I'll tell you what. (laughs) You are looking at the least sporty person on planet Earth, okay? Why are we friends? I am dreadfully competitive. So it does not translate. It does, no, absolutely not. You don't need to know my backstory. (laughs) Suffice to say that in, I used to do, I was a goalkeeper and I used to be called the windmill. Because you know that they send the worst player, in my case, into the goal because he can do least damage there. Now, back to this thing. Okay. Competitiveness. Hannah, mm-hmm. let's pick mm-hmm. up on you. Mm-hmm. Were you born competitive? Did sport teach you being, to be competitive? I was definitely born competitive, but I think the thing that sports has taught me is is the skills and the work ethic to actually translate that competitiveness into goals and achieving those goals and recognising the skills that competitiveness doesn't necessarily bring you alone in order to get places that you want to go. So I think if if you're not competitive, it's something that may be harder to, to find in yourself. But I was definitely lucky enough to have that at a young age. But where, where did that come from? I think it might sound a bit silly, but it comes from within. It's, as Katie said, it's just this constant hunger to want to be better. And as soon as you're reaching one goal, you already know that there's a next one four or five steps ahead. And it's not thinking one or two steps ahead. It's thinking five, six, seven steps ahead. And for me, that's what, when I think of why I'm competitive, that's the way my mind thinks. Make one small switch. Switching from shaving foam to all-natural de facto shaving oil will give you the smoothest, softest shave ever. Switching from shaving oil to de facto helps stop 20 million non-recyclable shaving foam cans go to landfills every year. Switching from shaving oil to de facto will save your skin, your pocket and your planet. DeFactoShave.com Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRentCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRentCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Backing great women-led businesses on every show. That great business show. You were in Davy. You're going back to Davy mm-hmm. when you're when you qualify, and you would, of course, because that's one of the challenges, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But what do you do differently? Um, I think looking back on, so I started my internship working from home in the middle of the pandemic, which is definitely a challenge. And, you know, starting a new job, getting to know new people was was quite daunting. It was something that definitely excited me. And what were you doing there? Uh, I was working in the capital markets uh, division on the equity sales team. So quite a small team, but definitely found it a challenge starting from home. Um, never mind going into the office, you know, getting to know who kind of fills what roles, the projects that were going on. I found it quite challenging initially to actually put my hand up and say, I know a little bit about this project that is going on. I want to be on that project. I want to add value there. And I probably didn't do that enough. I was I was too conservative and probably a little bit quiet in that regard. But you're young as well. I mean, you've got to give yourself some slack. I would never say that that's age is a reason not to put yourself forward for something. And I think if I had that mindset, I wouldn't be an Olympian at 22. I probably wouldn't have gone there. What well, a great answer. I wouldn't just be an Olympian at 22. Did you see on LinkedIn, they're all putting up O-L-Y for all the Olympians. Yeah. I'll never get an O-L-Y, I'm afraid. Mm-hmm. So when you go back... You, Mm-hmm. You like it's now open season. You're yeah. gonna you're gonna go big or go or go home. Yeah, definitely. I think it's it's 
something I'm, I'm glad I've learned at, at 2021 that I look back and I go, God, why didn't I put myself forward for that when I think about a particular project or something that was going on and there, there's these five skills that they think you'll need and I go, I have three of them, I'm not sure about the other two. And it's that different mindset that I say, I have three and that's more than enough to get me over the line. And the other two, I'm well able to to learn new skills and to get a bit of help where I need. Susan, in your experience, is it a gender thing as well? Men rarely identify their faults. I completely agree with you. And we were chatting about this yeah. over lunch and I was saying, what a female thing. And it's absolutely something I can't understand it. I think it needs to be taught at age five in kindergarten or something like this with women. We always say, can we do something? Where the men go, of course we can do so. Of course we can do and it. And they can make a horlicks like of it as well. Exactly. <laughs> you know, but they're, they're ready to put their hand up. I even noticed it from being involved in Going for Growth, which is the female business owner mentorship uh, program that I'm involved in. And I find confidence is something, even though you've the most talented people around the table, you still find one of the first things you've got to focus on is confidence and actually making them believe that they can achieve what they're setting out to achieve. There's no barriers there to you. Uh, and that is something, I don't know, we seem to be programmed with as women, mm -hmm. but we can actually achieve an awful lot. What well, can it actually be worked out of you or is it just so deeply ingrained, whether it's for over the millennia or whether it's over just because? Any any views there, Katie? Um, the magic wand is what we're looking for. Yeah, I'd say I'd say sport definitely helps in that sense because when you commit yourself as much as we do to something, you wouldn't do it unless you believed in yourself and your team and, and the ability around you. So I definitely think things like sport or, or hobbies can definitely help bridge that gap. And I think just we've been playing a little bit of catch up. But if you look at female sport in Ireland alone in the last three years and what has been achieved through whether it's Kelly Harrington, Rachel Blackmore, there's just so many incredible female sportswomen out there who are setting themselves up to be role models. And if I think back to when I was a youngster, a lot of my sporting role models were actually males. And that's crazy to say as now an, an international athlete. And I can confidently Olympian. say... Remember Olympian? <laughs> <laughs> I can confidently say now that, that a, girl, a girl grows up in Ireland and she picks a sport there's a very successful female competing at the top level in that sport in Ireland. Now, we never prepare questions on this podcast. They're getting worried. Katie, if you were, if a sponsor came along to you, is there anything that you said, you know, you're missing a trick here? It could be anything. It could be use me more or twisted around this way or some something where a sponsor just misses a trick not necessarily with you but across any sport that you've seen I think in sport anyway as an athlete you really appreciate the value of knowing the people that you're working with and having a personal relationship with them and I look a lot at other sponsorships speaking to peers of mine in other sports and it's a pot of cash, here you go. And there's no interaction with people at the top. There's no clear, we want to help you progress. How can we help you progress? And actually stuff that goes a lot further than just the financial backing. So that for me would be number one. That's very interesting. All right. And Hannah, in your case, mm -hmm. did David tell you as an ambassador, Obviously, you're not allowed to get in trouble with the law or anything like mm -hmm. that. <laughs> but do they tell you, please do this, this, this and this? Do they actually give you instructions as to how an ambassador performs? Um, not, there was no written rules. I think it was a very dynamic relationship. And I think um, going in, I probably had ideas of how I thought I could add value to them. And as, as Katie said, there's that relationship can be so much more than, than just from a financial aspect. Um, I think... Going back to working in there, I did some we webinars about females in sport and like we're speaking about now, those transferable skills from sport into business. Um, and over, over the midterm, we're going to do like a client hockey camp where they can bring the kids out, have a knock around, learn some new skills. So that's that extra step past 
past the financial backing that I think that's where a relationship goes to that next level and having worked in Davy and already knowing the people that I'm working with that's where it gets that and bit does further Susan Spence does she drag every last pound of flesh out of you but you do no, listen, would you go away, Connor? <laughs> I, I will say one thing is that sometimes when you do things in the community, you do it at a local level and an international level. Like as a company, you're trying to get your brand, you know, well known. So sometimes, you know, we uh, sponsor St. Mary's rugby team, for example. And again, we got very involved with them ex as well as that. But when we launched a new product, which was called at the time SoftGo 10, we were looking for the best number 10 in the world to be an international brand ambassador. And obviously the best at that time was Dan Carter. And we said, gosh, could we, like we did a brainstorm. Could we ever attract Dan Carter to sponsoring, you know, an Irish, a bit, you know, international software company. And he came on board. And one of the reasons... Hang on he, a second now. He didn't just come on board. No, it was no, like the no, back no, conversations. No, he did come these. on board. Look, so who rang lots, him? Somebody rang him and says... He had lots of choices. He had lots of choices. And one of the reasons for him joining let's call it Team Softco, was because we had been uh, sponsoring at grassroots level. So, you know, there is, and the last thing that the girls haven't mentioned is the fun of being a sponsor. Like we've had great fun together. I have to say, we're now sponsoring the men and we're trying to rec kind of think of ideas of how we can really make that work. And why did you choose to sponsor the men? I mean, the women have just done you so proud. Uh, well, I tell you why. Um, it literally happened, myself and Jim Covey, who's the other co-founder of Softco, we were looking at photographs um, and we were looking at the women alongside the men. And something that Katie had said to us was how uh, psychologically uplifting it was to have the logo on their shirt. And we were looking at the men and they had no logo on their shirt. And Jim said to me, do you ever phone Trevor Watkins up there and say to him, how, how, you know, what would it you know, how could we get involved with the men? Do they have a sponsor or not? So I did. They didn't have a sponsor. And the one request from Trevor was, we'd like you to sponsor the men on the same basis as the women. Meaning? Meaning, whatever we give to the women, would we give to the men? So you seldom hear that, where you're actually trying to, the men are unequal to the women. Yeah. So I thought that was fantastic. And that's how we got involved in sponsoring the men. And how do you, and again, look at, you're putting your cash into this, how do you extract your pound of flesh out of that? Well, how do you use it to get your business bigger? Well, that's a really, really great point uh, because we look at our customers, they're financial people in different markets and our product helps them make better decisions and automates their invoice processing. So if I look at it in America, for example, our customer is the head of finance. They're typically interested in golf. So we have an up-and-coming golfer called Troy Merritt. Now, where we've looked at this year all the different tournaments he plays at, and actually, coincidentally, last week, he came fifth in a PGA, which was fantastic for him. You, and we're saying to our customers... you touch. I'm not... No, I'll tell you. But the thing about it is, we have customers and we're saying, OK, we have customers in Boston. Where's the next tournament he's playing there? Let's, you know, bring our customers to meet him. Or, good do, have you ever done this top golf? No, you haven't, obviously, because you told me you do no sport. Anyway, it's you go into this sort of golf arena and you could have your, your, your brand ambassador give them a few tips on golfing. Isn't that fantastic? The customer enjoys it. You enjoy it as well. And it's a way of, I suppose, having a better relationship with your customer. That's what, what you get back from it, as well as your brand. Like when Troy Merritt was on fifth and PGA, one stage he was first and there was the Softco logo. In America, on television. I Fantastic. say there was Susan Spence sweating, saying, go on, go Hope on. Get, he came first <laughs> in the end. But no, no, but I mean, I, you know, did you watch it? Of course I watched it, yeah. absolutely, yes. Yeah. I'd say so when he was oh, ahead. It was great fun, great fun. Listen, we're going to run out of time, and I'm just going to ask uh, our two women guests here, Kitty Mullen and Hannah McLaughlin, as to, Kitty, we we'll start with you. You're, what would you love to see Ireland, Inc., businesses in Ireland do with sponsorship to help just you. No, I don't mean Katie Mullen. I mean women hockey because you are now destined for huge things, I think. Yeah, I think, um, to be honest, we look at our, you know, rival nations and the backing that they have across the board in terms of their, I suppose, 
their institutes and, you know, the funding they get there. They have home stadiums. They have, you know, so many like facilities and that's probably where we are lacking as as a hockey nation. So, you know, there's there's definitely a gap there in order for us to have like a home stadium venue where we bring in big crowds. You know, you look back on those two nights in Donnybrook in the second and third of November where we qualified for the Olympics. We stepped onto that. We took, you mentioned visualization earlier. We stepped onto that pitch for the first time on the, I think it was the Wednesday and went out and played an Olympic qualifier on the Saturday because that pitch was brought in from overseas and laid on top of the rugby pitch. And for us not to have a home stadium where we could bring in the same crowd in over and over again and that those tickets sold out in, in so quickly. And we had over the course of the two days, 6,000 in the stadium and you know for that to be a once off just one time to go to the Olympics it's not good enough and that's where we need you know we have a home nations coming up now later this year the month before we go to the World Cup and it's going to be in Ireland and I'm already asking the question well where are we going to play it and there's a few different locations being thrown around and that's where you need a big venue which all the other sports have so for me, that's massive. And, and, you know, obviously we're so fortunate to have Softco on board, but there's a, a, a stadium and a project that could have 10, 12, 15 sponsors involved with it. She's not going to build a, sp- a st- <laughs> stadium for you. <laughs> Hannah, same question to you. Is there something, a magic wand, we're going to give it to you now? And that's a lovely mm-hmm. answer about the stadium. Is there anything else that you can think of or has she just stolen your thunder? Um, I suppose she has a little bit, but I think, you know, probably coming into the programme, looking at bridging that gap between us and the other top nations in the world. I think people sometimes think that 100% of that gap happens on the pitch with getting better physically, technically, tactically. But I suppose I'm coming to realise that a lot of that has to happen off the pitch and a lot of that bridging that gap is completely out of our control. And we do need third parties outside of things that happen on the pitch in order to bridge that gap. And as Mullen said, we've a home tournament this year and we don't know where we're playing it yet. So I That's think. That's wrong. It's absolutely wrong and silly, isn't it? Silly is probably putting it very nicely. It, it's yeah. frustrating, I think. And, you know, we've friends and family that come to every, that come to all our matches, but we want to be able to. A few to, dogs as well. Yeah, a few dogs on the <laughs> sideline. Everyone's welcome. But we want to be able to host tournaments with, with much mm. bigger crowds than that. And I think the interest and the demand in Ireland is there, but we, we can't facilitate that. And it's a highly televisual sport because it's so simple with the, the size mm-hmm. of the pitch and everything else. Definitely. I don't know. I can't answer your problems, but sorry, Katie, you were going to say, were you going to say something? I was just going to say, if you look at the likes of Argentina, now every, every other nation nearly longs for that phone call from Argentina to say, will you come over and play us? Because you go over there and hockey is just massive. It's almost bigger than it is in Holland. And, you know, when we, when, when the girls talk about, I've played for 10 years now and I've never had a trip to Argentina and I'm just like longing for it because <laughs> the way the girls the talk Argent- about it. the Argentinian <laughs> ambassador is listening. <laughs> but, but yeah, that, but that's you are competing and I know that you have played camogie, so you are com- uh, competing with camogie and camogie is very much on the up as well. Yeah, it's fantastic and, and I'm very friendly with Grace Walsh who plays for Kilkenny and um, she was just telling me about the Little Woods backing that they've got again this year and that's only growing and they're trying to get to the level that the ladies football is and, and the main driver to get the ladies football up to that level was Little as well. So as Hannah's saying, you do all this stuff on the pitch, but there is a definite trend where sponsors getting on board, bringing that level of professionalism, that level of belief is resulting in success in female sport in Ireland. Look at Leona Maguire as well. She only recently got her sponsors through the line and goes out and wins her first women's uh, PGA. And Davies amongst them, yeah. aren't they? And KPMG, I think, as well. KPMG, yeah. yeah. So well done to them. Unfortunately, we are out of time because I'm fascinating. And I, sorry, I should have last, last, two last questions, of yeah. course. Three mm-hmm. last questions now to think about it. First of all, on the hockey side, where will you end up in the World Cup? Final position to, to be confirmed. I think we can definitely get out of our group. 
Right. And that's the only thing that we need to focus on at the moment. The rest happens. Do you know who says the exact same stuff? Johnny yeah. Sexton. Do you ever hear him? He yeah. says it works and for I him. To, so. I was talking to Jamie Heaston the other day about that. He says, you're not allowed to say anything else. Don't say yeah. the colour blue in case of something. Now, you know what the rules are. Hire in a heartbeat. Who would you, Katie Mullen, hire in a heartbeat? I reckon I'd hire Mary Peters. Oh, yeah. Olympian yeah. gold medalist yeah. uh, from Northern Ireland. Just Good. because... Olympian. <laughs> just because um, Mary is now 82. Is she really? And I remember her winning. She has the most amazing trust fund um, set up to support young athletes. And she just knows everything about every young athlete across the country before they even know they're going to be successful. She knows it. And wow. I just think, yeah, to, to have that, you know, level of awareness of what's going on, she would be fantastic in any sort of setting in order to advise or, or help strive. Okay. Well, as we say, Mary Peters, you're hired. And uh, Hannah, Hannah McLaughlin, who would you hire in a heartbeat? Um, I think I would hire um, a guy called Stephen Bartlett. He's um, an English guy who runs a podcast called The Diary of a CEO. And from listening to a lot of his episodes, I just think he's the insights to the most successful people all around the world in, in various different disciplines. And I think, you know, knowledge is power and applying that to any setting, I think would just be incredible. So I'd hire him. You do know that this is the world's best business podcast, so he must have the second best business podcast. I think just, just, made... <laughs> just try it first, he's definitely in second. <laughs> Listen, ladies, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. That is Katie Mullen and Hannah McLaughlin, and huge success to you on the forthcoming, because I didn't know about the home internationals, but uh, obviously on the World Cup is going to be the big one that we will all be rooting with uh, for you. And uh, Susan, you're going to stay with me until uh, a little bit longer. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thinking of travel? If so, make sure to make De Facto, the world's best shaving oil, your choice of travel companion. A 25 milliliter bottle of De Facto means no hassle at airports, no bulky cans to carry, and the guarantee of the world's best shave. DeFactoShave.com. Paul Nolan is one of Ireland's most high-profile national hunt horse racing trainers. However, if horse racing isn't your thing, he's also one of the country's most entertaining raconteurs. So do stay listening. Paul's left school at 15 to work on the family farm. The uncertainty of farming with lamb prices at 80 euro one week and maybe 45 the next made him look for another career, wisely maybe. He eventually found his way to the Jim Budger stables and in 1996 he struck out on his own and since then he's had 500 winners across all codes. But here's the thing, Paul's stable, Tuberona in Enniscorthy, is sponsored by Softco. I hadn't realised until this week that horse stables can be and are sponsored. So as we say, for me, every day is a school day. Paul Nolan, welcome to That Great Business Show. My pleasure. Let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. How do you make money out of horses? Hard working winners and good owners. Yeah. So <laughs> what are you doing differently with the hard work to get the winners, to keep the owners happy, that probably bring other owners into you? Well, I suppose it's such a team game. Uh, you know, we, we have... Uh, some very good guys working with us as well uh, as regards I won't say working with us they're working for us because they've other people to work for as well but uh, we would have uh, Jerry Hogan Peter Vaughan helping us to source and buy horses as well so it all depends on the, the horse you get in you can only train what you get and uh, they have to have the ability for you to get it out of them and, uh, and it's my job to get the ability out but you can't put ability into them if they haven't got it And how do you draw that ability out of them? Well, it's a question of you're, you're trying to, uh, have your facilities as safe and as, as good as they can be where your farm is situated and the undulations you have, uh, that, that the whole thing comes into play. Uh, uh, everyone has facilities now. They're all getting better. Uh, probably horses are getting fitter. So you're, you're always trying to look for a different angle, what you can do differently to make it safer, to make it probably more testing for the animal to get fitter and to try have the next uh, 
try to have the next edge to make it better. But you are competing with really, really big names. Now, I'm told that you're in the top 10 at the moment from yeah. scratch, which is not a bad climb. That's right. But I presume that the aim is to be number one one day. Yeah, you, you could never, you know, it's, 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 it's definitely has to be always in your mind. Uh, you, you have to be realistic as well, but it's, it's, it's definitely a goal. Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully we can, we can improve every year uh, to eventually improve from number 10 to get up to number nine, eight. And if it takes 10 years to get to number one. But it's not like the rest of them are standing still. No, no, it's not like the rest of them are standing still, but you still have, you still have, you're, you're, you're always, you always have the chance of getting the good horse that can bring you there on the big day. And when you get him there on the big day, you have chances of getting more of them. And it's, and it's all, it's always, there's always hope. The great thing is, I, I mean, I'm a bit of a novice uh, in this whole horse racing. Like, uh, again, Jim Coffey, co-founder in Softco, he's seriously into it. And in fact, his daughter, Charlotte, she's been down, uh, you know, mucking out and riding out horses. They're seriously into it. But when you go down to Paul Nolan's, I, I think yard is a, not a great word because it's so professional. I mean, you go around the horses, Paul takes you around, explains the personality of the different horses. The, the nutrition that that horse gets. Then you look as you go and watch them riding out and it is an incredibly professional environment. And if you didn't have that, you wouldn't be in the premiership of horse trainers, Paul. That was my impression, looking into it from afar. And yes, then we get, and we have a great horse. Like, dare I say, Mrs. Milner. Yeah, well, it's true. you know, Susan, and, that, and that's, the, you know, it, don't like sort of blow on your own trumpet and that and thanks for those words. But, you know, we we sort of, Suppose we, we, you, you improve the place every year. We always, if we if we make any sort of money, it always goes back into the place. And if there's something to be rectified or something we can make better, uh, we're always looking to try and make it better. And, you know, we, you know, it's, 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 we always have access to the, the, to the bigger yards and to, you know, and, but basically you're, you're always looking for, uh, you can have all the facilities you want, but you need the good horses. And, and that's what we're looking for now. We're looking for the good horses. Where is the margin? We love knowing about where the real money is made. Do you make it out of prize money? Hardly. Do you make it out of fees from the owners? Or do you make it from buying and selling uh, the bloodstock? Or what? Do you, where do you make the actual money? Well, it's, we were... Um, it, it's. it's <clears throat> I'd say um, there's... Farmers around me now, farmer sons around me, uh, and they're, they're nearly all based in Wexford that, uh, again, went away from dairy farm and tillage farm and sheep farm. They went away from farming and, and, and they got in to the horse industry and their whole business is sales. They, they've created a different market even that, that, that for the breeders because they go in and they buy 50% of the horses that are nearly sold every year and they, nurture them along as, as, as three-year-olds, turn them into four-year-olds to go point to pointing with them. So they're coming into the system far earlier than they used to 10, 15, 20 years ago. And these guys are making their living from that, from total sales. So they bring the horse and they win their point to points and then they go to the sales. They go to the sales. So those are the horses that we're trying to pick out. And everyone tries to pick out the better ones and it's everyone's opinion of what the better one is. And, and that's where you're learning the whole time the mistakes you've made in horses you've bought with different defects in their limbs or whatever it may be. And yet some of them turn out to be champions. And I know it's kind of a different area, but it was not Vincent O'Brien's big thing of the whole thing. He could read confirmation like nobody else. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure, Vincent was, 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 was definitely a one-off of his time and he was so far ahead of everyone else. And uh, he was the first, I think, to sort of go to America to, to get the Northern Dancer line. And... Uh, he certainly uh, set a trend for Ireland being one of the, 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 the best breeders and, and, and trainers of, of race horses in the world. So are you a horse, now I'm being serious when I ask this, yeah. are you a horse whisperer? Do, do you understand something about a horse that other most other people just don't hear, see, feel? I wouldn't think so, no. I, 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 well, what have you no, got? I, I don't know. I, I'd say you've, you've just... Uh, uh, um, I don't know what I don't know what you call it. I suppose it's a um, it's a relentless sort of you know, you're always striving to sort of be more successful next year than this year, and it's a it's the love of something that even if you know you're you're 
money wise you're it's 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 you're putting it all back into the place so you're not going to change your life in any way that way you're just it's the buzz of getting a winner that's unbelievable it's the, I don't know what you'd call it but it's just to see a horse cross the line in front uh, no matter what sort of a race it is granted the bigger days are more important because it's it's such a relief to know that you've you've you've, you've won on the big day and you're just that bit you're a foot taller coming out of parade ring so for the business side, what do you actually want? You said that you wanted the best uh, owners and the best horses to come to you, and you get that from winning. So the margin is obviously in having those great horses in your yard. Absolutely. It's, you don't, I, I, and that's the, probably the business side of it that I wouldn't be good. You don't sort of think of money, really. You don't think of the profit oh, margins no, in it. and yes, you do. Come on, you're, you're yeah. really, but, but really successful. But I think it's successful. a combination. I think it's, and it's like we were talking earlier with the, the hockey team and we were talking about their high standards. And I think that's one of the reasons why you're so successful. God, I can't even say the word successful. Because you've got really high standards. You're brilliant at picking out horses. You've got great standards. And that results in a much better product and a great up chance to win. Yeah, well, you know, everyone has their their idea of what they think the racehorse looks like. Now, you know, and and over the years, and, and every year you're learning more. And you know, as I said, there's there's different little defects that some people would overlook that I wouldn't. And and it's they're trying to tell you their reasoning for this, and I sort of pick my own reasons. And it's the very same as someone judging someone. A footballer. A footballer or anything else that can say, here's a chap with brilliant skill, but here's a chap that'll go through a brick wall for you. This fella might be a little bit timid. This fella, and it's maybe leaders then that mightn't be as good as the other players, but he's a great leader on the field and he can do different things for you. So that's when a team comes together, when you've a little bit of everything in the team. And then you have the finisher that can score the goal. And, 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 you know, it's, that's the, what I'd look at is, is the, the medium horses that can win the normal races to keep you going and then you get the, the fella to score the goal the stars. In, the, in the grade one. Oh, which is and a perfect segue to me for winning, the scoring your goals. Tell me about some of the stories about where you found this hack, a hack of a horse and that you built him up or her up and that she won for you. What was your best turnaround? The best turnaround? Well, I suppose, you see, you're always looking at, at, at um, you know, the very first horse I bought, we went up with, four men to spend a thousand pound a piece and I went to the first Land Rover sale and it was the very first sale I was at. They weren't selling Land and Rovers, it was, uh, it was a Land Rover sale, it was called, yeah, it was sponsored <laughs> by Land Rover, yeah, Land Rover. So you, 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 the, the horses that are sold and qualify for a race called the Land Rover, but when you win a Land Rover, if you win it and the, the seller gets a Land Rover and the buyer gets And uh, every horse that was making way too much, so two of the guys went home, so that was two grand gone. So I was left with two grand. <laughs> okay. And the very last horse into the ring had two turned in feet, but he could move well from the side. And we bought that fella. And he ended up when he's made in hurdle in Leopardstown. And he was fifth in Cheltenham on the same year. And that was the very first winner I had. So it was great that the very first winner we had was a, he had, he had a, 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 a I would say, a, 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 he deformed front legs, but that's why we could afford him. So he went from value of three grand up to, well, what's the, the, did you sell him or what did you do? No, no, we didn't sell him. No, no. And he, but he won, he won several races after, like he won listed chase. And, he, and would he have made enough horse. money to justify the three grand? And oh, ab- absolutely. He was one of the stories that he was bought for very little. And he, he would have, he would have made money for people instead of costing money. And very few horses paid their way. That's not according to your website. <laughs> well, there's certain about things you, you have to say. <laughs> That's marketing. Positivity. Marketing. Positivity. <laughs> so I love the whole thing that, you know, we are obviously very, very good at horses in this country. But I think, am I right in saying that the, uh, Britain, the British are trying to up their game as well? Where is, where is the growth for you in coming years in the business? The growth, I'd say, it, the main thing is to 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 is the stock that you buy, to give yourself the best chance possible of winning, and to learn every year about movement and about about their makeup and the way they're put together, and to try and 
to try and look under the bonnet as much as you can. But how can, you know, I know you have vets, but do you use any appliance of science? Are you using no, any not, scanners? No, or it's not rocket just, science. Like, I mean, I suppose it's when you're so used to looking at something. I think if you're so used to something, if you don't get good at it, you, you do something else. You know, there's, there's times you, if you're just not good at something, if you're supposed to be this and you're supposed to be that and all of a sudden, if you're supposed to make people laugh and you're a comedian and you're looking down at the audience and there's no one laughing and they all seem to go, well, then you may change your jokes or just get out of the business. <laughs> so, I, you know, if, if, you're, if, you, if you seem to be getting things wrong and every horse you buy doesn't make it or doesn't win or goes lame or whatever, well, then get someone else to buy them for you or you're going to go out of business very quick. What's it like when a horse fails and the owner isn't happy? Do they have it's, Well, there's no point the in you ride. being happy going in, so you definitely have to look as sad as the owner does <laughs> when you're walking in. So uh, you'd have your sad poems ready on the way in. And, uh, and basically you're just, you know, because there's no doubt you are as sad as they are, even though they've spent the money for training fees and you said, I think we're going to run well here. And then you're just waiting for the jockey to say what he thought went wrong. And then you're sort of put your few lines in to see what you thought went wrong. And if there's nothing really that anyone can see, that there's no real obvious mistake or there's no real obvious tactics that were got wrong, then you just have to sort of look at the vet side of it and test the horse when he goes home, scope him, blood test him to see was there any viral or had he a flu on the day or had he did he cough the next day and there was something brewing him and it made him... Well, it's the very same as a football team or a soccer team or a hurling team and they they lose by, like, I mean, Wexford got beaten by Dublin by 16 points. The following week, they came back out and they beat the All-Ireland Champions by a goal. How, what happened the week before? And yet, if it happens to a horse, they're all blood tested and analysed and everyone wants to know what happened. When it's a human that on, on the performs, if a, a guy goes out and he breaks the course record in golf and the following day, he doesn't make the cut. Is he... Do you go and stick a scope down and see there phlegm on his lungs? With a bee sting him I on the elbow or what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and everyone wants an answer when something goes wrong. And they're right. But there's times that, you know, that, you know, do you make up something or do you just say it's one of these well, days? One of, the that funniest, something... one of the funniest ones, BBC did a, a sort of documentary on you guys and they had it subtitled if you can imagine that it was hilarious and Paul had one of those owners and it went around once and he kind of well you know wasn't the horse's day second time it went around and the jockey you know he wasn't tough enough the third day, day you turned around and I can't really say the words you said but it was to the extent of the horse is just useless <laughs> like we all cracked up laughing when you said that yeah well you see there's times there's only a certain amount of sad poems or excuses you can come up with and there's inevitability to sort of certain horses and uh but you had to come out and make fools of you. you. You know, you're you're working them at home and some of them were worked very poorly and you have no real reason why they did that and they could go up the gallop the next day and everything is okay. It's the very same as you getting out of bed in the morning and you're feeling a bit sniffly and you're this and you're that and the minute you walk down the stairs and get a glass of water, you're flying again. So there's times you can overanalyze things. Viscosity. When you shave, you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother. De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's that's why de facto leaves your face, underarms, or legs nick free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRentCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy to use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRentCloud.com, 100% Irish owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Subscribe today to That Great Business Show on your favourite podcast platform, including Apple and Spotify. And, and Paul, you like, we had a great day. We weren't physically there, unfortunately. Last year, the Cheltenham win with Mrs. Milner. I mean, yeah. did you always believe that that horse was had it in her to win Cheltenham? Before you answer, explain, well, you have oh, a toenail interest in okay. what you own, Mrs. Milner. Yes. Now, the, okay. the, this is a... I'm a, sorry, apologize here. This is a bit of a bit of a story. But Mrs. Milner's mother is called the girl on the hill. 
And my father, when he used to have a few drinks, he would do a toast to the girl on the hill. None of us knew who the girl on the hill was, but we thought it was a great name for a horse. So we have the girl on the hill. Girl on the hill had a foal. And we said, ah, oh, sure, listen, there's one for Susan kind of stuff. And I'm like, fair enough. And we could try and come up with a name. Now, my fa- favourite footballer is James Milner. Not because he plays for Liverpool, but because he played for Leeds. And I'm a mad Leeds United supporter. So we call the horse Mrs. Milner. And then what happens? Mrs. Milner goes out and wins at Cheltenham. And James Milner got tweeted. I think he has about 2 million followers or if not more on it. And he actually put a tweet up to say, to save me replying to everyone who's WhatsApped me, yes, I backed it. No, it's not my horse. Yes, the wife is demanding all the winnings. <laughs> and that went out on Twitter and we, we, it was fantastic. Yeah. So maybe we get James Milner to, she's running again Yeah, this year. Yeah, hopefully all going well. And, and uh, no, that was brilliant. I mean, uh, an awful pity word in there. There's nothing, you know, when something special like happens like that, it's, it's an awful pity you're not there to enjoy it live. Uh, but listen, it, it was great that Cheltenham went ahead. If it hadn't, she wouldn't have been there. And, um, you know, but, uh, myself and my wife, Catherine, were looking at it at home. Uh, oh, you weren't there? Room. No, I wasn't there either, no. Huh. And, uh, um, expected it to run well. And then a few things happened during the race that we thought, She'd no chance now. She's only if she'd be lucky just to finish in the first five or six. Uh, horse loose horse hampered her, and she got different few things. And then all of a sudden she came, and it looked like she was going. And that's she's going to be definitely placed. She's definitely going to be placed. And then when she hit the front and kicked on, I just was still so worried about the last hurdle because she tends to be a little bit brave and she can come up a stride too soon. And but she measured it perfect and popped it. And then I knew nothing could happen from there to the line. I mean, still think catching, I, I definitely nearly got a heart attack. I'd say I have sort of blood pressure and stuff like that anyway, but I, I would have liked to test it. the wrong stage. business. I'd say, <laughs> I'd say the thing would have blew off my arm if anyone had tested it. But uh, I actually twisted my ankle on the side of the carpet. I jumped a little bit too high and my knee gave away. I have a couple of different problems since I turned 50. Things are just not working anymore. And, uh, but anyway, Catherine was there and straight away we rang the cabin as they came down with a bottle of wine and then several replays later and several bottles of wine later, the whole thing just was great. Hadn't even <laughs> hang over the next day. <laughs> it was great. The future of horse racing with you. What, is, what does it look like for you? Um, I couldn't be any happier. I, I, I just think that, um, you know, we're, as I said, I don't want to just wear out or get people bored by saying that we're very lucky to have the people we have working for us and to have the people but we have involved in But you choose them as well. You know this thing about luck is it's amazing when you put the effort into it you get lucky. Yeah but you can't choose your owners I mean they have to choose you. There's so many people out there. And, and do you and, hustle and, them hard or like mm, you are in competing with other trainers? No I wouldn't hustle them hard because I'd rather that they'd want to come to me rather than me force them into it because then it's my fault completely if the horse is no good. They don't have a good time. But do they come over to you for a chat? Because you're well known for a chat. Yeah, I, I, would, I don't know whether to come over for me a chat or not. I don't. I, I, I don't. I'm not able to say that. I, I tend to go out to the track to look at the race myself, and I, I, I don't stop anyone from following me around or anything like that. There's not too many following me around a bit now. Anyway, <laughs> but, you know. Um, no, but owners probably enjoy your company. Is that part of the of the marketing pitch? Uh, I th- I don't know I can't I I, I don't I, I, I listen I, I enjoy people's company and and uh, so I'm, told. I'm not I'm not alone or I I, I don't like being on my own and uh, that's basically it you know, but equally you have to enjoy yourself you know when you're going I mean it's so <laughs> probably the odds are that your horse is going to get placed or not actually win and even the week before or Miss Milner ran a race earlier and yeah. she came nowhere yeah and then of course. The, Typical thing happens, she wins and everybody comes up to you and goes, you never told me she was running. Yep. But uh, I mean, this year now, you have six horses at Cheltenham. Like yep. last year we'd won yep. and you're six now. I mean, that's incredible achievement, Paul. Yeah, well, listen, we're, 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 that's great. Thank thank God. And, um, you know, hopefully they get there now as well, Susan. It's all, every day is another day. You know, you're, you, you have the same things to, to not say worry about, but you're just keeping an eye on things every day. But, Touchwood, we're, 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 we're delighted to have, uh, those horses, those better horses to be able to enter on the big days. And, uh, 
you know, it's, it's fantastic. It's not all about Cheltenham either. There's several good races at home. The prize money is far better at home. So, is it? you know, yeah, yeah. the prize what money is far that? better at home. Um, well, I'd say there's probably less racing and uh, I think they're, they're looking at several different ways of changing in, in England at the moment. Uh, you know, possibly they're not going through the greatest time uh, and they'll have to change things, I'd say. Um, has Brexit caused you problems getting your horses there and back and stuff? <clears throat> it's different. It, it has the, it definitely as regards uh, when the horses win their pint of pints and they go over to England to be sold. It's very expensive for Irish people to buy them to come back to Ireland. You're, you're nearly talking on one third of their cost added on top of them again to get them home. Why? For different VAT reasons and there's different there fat implications in that. Yeah, there's VAT to, for a horse that's, you know, some people when they buy a horse in England now, they leave it in England to be trained because they're charged more VAT to bring them home. And that certainly would be uh, a plus for English trainers and not a plus for us. Uh, so that's why I'm trying to buy them before they go over there. <laughs> 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 the mysteries of VAT. I must get a VAT expert on about the VAT on the uh, process. Yeah, yeah, I don't I'm know enough about it. Uh, Colin, let's say that'll be really exciting. Yeah. Podcast. VAT. VAT is yeah. very interesting. I'm telling you. We've done a piece on it before. I can't believe that. The, uh, I won't go into the VAT on candles. The shape no. of a candle can determine the VAT on it, but we won't go in there. Right. Listen, we have two more questions because uh, Susan mentioned there that you have six runners at uh, Cheltenham. You better... Choose one. If you are you allowed to choose one as I, a tip? Yeah, I think you're allowed to say it on air. Yeah, but you're not allowed. I can't tell you individually because that's inside information. So yeah. it's all very strict. Well, there's two. Of but us I can here, tell. So I, can tell I can tell. I can tell five hundred people, but I can't. I can't oh, tell one. We're into thousands, oh, okay. thousands, and thousands yeah, of yeah, listeners yeah. here. So go yeah. and tell us who's going to win. Oh God, who's going to win? I say, yeah, we've we've. we've uh, obviously, Mrs. Milner. I hope will run very well. She's very consistent and uh, she's in great form. That wasn't um, a sad poem. Did you hear that? That no, was a happy no, poem. Yeah. Uh, we have a little horse. Uh, the, the one thing, Connell, the, the, the ones that will go over, I, I'm, they're going over, they're not going over to make up the numbers. That's what I'd say. So the ones that are going over, they probably have a um, reasonable, equal chance, uh, you know, a little horse called HMSC horse. He qualified the other day. He has a little squeak. And uh, we've what is, is that good or bad? To have a squeak, a squeak, yeah, I'd a squeak of a, a chance. A squeak is good. A squeak is good. <laughs> yeah. What what part of them squeaks? <laughs> that I'm going to leave that to your imagination. <laughs> I have. I it's know a new so word for us. This. It's a new word. A squeak. <laughs> yeah. Well, for a horse, does Mrs. Milner squeak, or does she have a, a does she have a squeaky bit? I tell you, Mrs. <laughs> Milner has a brother called back in the room yeah. and Jim used to go, go down to Paul and James <clears> they'd be talking business and the guys would go off to do something and Jim would go lads back in the room and Paul says that's a great name for a horse so, actually there's a question <laughs> how do you what are you allowed to call a horse you can, or what are you not allowed to call a horse you, you can't uh, there, there's times people get names through that, that uh, when they're looked into a little bit deeper they probably shouldn't have been allowed you know there could be meaning in a different language or something uh, like that or a bit rude yeah it could be well, what was your favourite one um, there was one fella called Michal Moore okay <laughs> <laughs> and was he one of yours <laughs> nothing to do with me no no <laughs> You'd I'd be, be more with Michal Bjog, Bjog. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> Sorry, now you, we we're off now come back to me now HMS Seahorse is one of your tips yeah, we, and I know you're trying to be all equal to all of your owners, but come on, a little bit of insight. Yeah, we, should, we, we have two very nice bumper horses. Now they were beaten by, um, uh, they were both of them were beaten by the same horse, but they bought one as well, and they're they're very nice horses. Uh, um, there's one horse called Sandor Clegane, and the other horse is called Joy on Machine, and uh, both of them are young horses. They're only five. We're very lucky to have them. How do you celebrate? How do we celebrate? He's very uh, reserved. I can, I can tell reserved. you that. That's what uh, I'm All my elocution lessons come out. <laughs> <laughs> and a little bit posh. The whole thing is a bit posh uh, when we celebrate, really. And um, But some people enjoy it. Some you know, people do. Some people enjoy it. Yeah, you know, we normally wait till we go home into our own house to sort of really sort of let go. You know, that's, that's when um, the confetti comes out. Okay, come here to me. Final question. Higher... In a heartbeat. Who would Paul Nolan hire in a heartbeat? I would hire um, a, a young father. My young, my father back in his young days, 
definitely the through the bad times he'd definitely pull you through them with a smile on his face and uh, I'd bring my father back 40 years ago. You're the second person, I think, who has said that over the years or the year and a half that we've been on the thing. That's a nice, I always thought it was a very, very nice sentiment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great, great, great work ethic and, uh, and yet time for his family as well, but just a savage man to work on. And did he know anything about horses? Not an iota. <laughs> but don't, don't let him hold on now. A bit like <laughs> myself. <laughs> he still seems to know, he knows an awful lot about him in his own mind. And I sort of leave him there. <laughs> With the happiness of that. I'm still... <laughs> Wondering, and someday I'll get to the bottom of it. What do you have, and people like you, that you get as you when you've started this whole chat with me about how you get the best out of a horse? Um, do you talk horse? Absolutely not. I probably do. <laughs> the second part of the that an awful lot of people use, uh, but um, um. No, I, I think it's it's just you have to love animals and you have to love sport and you have to sort of know what it's like to train hard yourself, maybe. And to know that you, you were a Wexford hurler. Oh, well, I was so to a certain standard. I, you see, I, I've you know, read my sport stuff. again. Sport again. <laughs> but it's a, you know, I trained hard. Uh, it wasn't that good, but I trained very hard. And you yeah, played football of, as well. Yeah, I did. I did. But no, you know, on minor under twenty one teams and yeah. on the senior team for a year or two. But I, I, I had an All Ireland. Uh, we did an All Ireland junior medal, and we were three or four of us brought onto the senior team from that, and it was great years, and I enjoyed it. Uh, would have loved to stay longer at it, really, but that was it. Uh, but great I, I just love the GA. I love all sports probably the GA definitely hurling especially just uh, I love watching hurling now I, I, if I wasn't going racing I'd go to hurling matches and I uh, love being involved in the club at home and uh, I just think it, as well as the racing people like I'd be fond of all sports people really I just think it's great uh, What you missed earlier on is I have no idea about sport whatsoever so you probably would never get on with me oh, I'd say <laughs> I'd, I'd say I would Connell I'd say I would <laughs> Paul Nolan thank you for joining us on that great business show great <laughs> You make me smile. <laughs> <laughs> and that is it from That Great Business Show, episode 75. My hugest thank you to the world's greatest co-host, she be Susan Spence. Thank you, Colonel. Tough fight your own. Please share, like, retweet this podcast with all of your connections. See, connections, I should have asked you about that a bit. But you don't have uh, owners of horses, you have connections, isn't that right? That's right. Yeah, I've never understood. Yep. That's very posh. Your connection, you see. Obviously, yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, so are your connections on social media and do it now, please, before you forget. It's just the click of a button to you, but it means commercial success for us. And speaking of commercials, why not advertise with us? Our thousands of lovely listeners are the best informed business audience in the country and they need to know about your business. Great brands like Big Red Cloud, Isme, Virgin Media, Udras Nagurtachta already back us. Joe Join them. Contact us today for more information. Do also subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast platform. That makes sure that Ireland's best business podcast is always on your phone or wherever. And as always, my thanks to the team here at Dublin Podcast Studios, including today's sound engineer, uh, Brian. Thank you so much, Brian. And also Peter Rice, who every week adds his spit and polish to make us the world's best sounding podcast. And that great business show has also been asked by Team GBS members Dog Patch Labs and Irish Tech Hub Networks to tell you that their first Friday meetups are back. A brilliant opportunity to network with other startups right across the country. These virtual events will give great insights from world class companies like Google and HubSpot, and they're all coordinated by our old pal DC Catalan in Cork get more info from DC by emailing him at dc at dogpatchlabs.com and tell him Team GBS sent you. And as always, the great business insights you hear on That Great Business Show are only made possible thanks to our sponsor, the great makers of the world's best shaving oil, de facto made in Mayo, sold worldwide. Our thanks to them and don't forget now to buy Business Plus magazine as well. So for me, Conal Amoran, Kuramina Mahagov, Arfat,